Hello, this is Mark Tooley, president of the Institute on Religion and Democracy and editor of Providence, a journal of Christianity and American foreign policy. And uh, today I have the pleasure of uh, speaking uh, with my friend Matthew Kranig, a professor of political science at Georgetown University. And also, uh, he may need to correct me on his title, but I believe he is a fellow at the Atlantic uh, Council in Washington, DC. He has just published a uh, important uh, new book, uh, and let me make sure I get the title uh, correct here. Uh, the Return of Great Power Rivalry, Democracy versus Autocracy from the Ancient World to the US and China. So obviously extremely uh, timely right now. He previously uh, has published a book on um, ethics and uh, nuclear weapons, and uh, Providence, our journal, was uh, pleased to host him several times to uh, discuss that very important issue, which typically is not addressed very thoughtfully in uh, Christian uh, thought circles. So Matthew, thank you so much uh, for joining us. Well, Mark, it's really my pleasure to come back and uh, chat with an old friend. And um, uh, yeah, excited to talk about the new book. And um, for the record, the title at the Atlantic Council is the deputy director of the Scowcroft Center there. But uh, thanks again very much. And I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Matthew. And is there anything else in your background that I should uh, lift up uh, beyond your Georgetown and Atlantic Council uh, affiliation? Well, I, I have um, worked in the U.S. government uh, in both the Department of Defense and the Central Intelligence Agency uh, and still do a lot of consulting with both uh, organizations. So um, my research in this book in particular often tries to bridge the gap between kind of scholarly debates, but also real world and pressing policy uh, problems. And I should point out uh, personally that uh, the IRD office is right across the street from the Atlantic Council and uh, my office, uh, I literally uh, sometimes several times a day see uh, Matthew uh, walking down 15th Street, always looking very busy and very dapper <laughs> as he heads towards his office at the Atlantic Council. Well, Matthew, if you could uh, tell us uh, how you came to write this uh, latest book. Well, uh, I actually got the idea for it 12 years ago. Uh, after the global financial crisis. Because if you'll remember after the financial crisis, many people were saying, um, well, this US model of open market democracy uh, seems to have failed. Uh, China's model of state-led capitalism seems to have weathered the storm better. Uh, maybe China has the better model. Uh, and um, that's a question that's becoming relevant again. Uh, the 2017 US national security strategy says the return of great power competition with China is the greatest threat facing the country. Uh, and in the coronavirus uh, uh, era, people are asking, are democracies or autocracies responding better to this crisis? With many people saying that autocracies, uh, because of the big top-down uh, firm leadership, can, can do better. Uh, so that's how I uh, came to the book. And um, as, as we'll discuss, I, I came to the opposite conclusion, that actually uh, democracies uh, tend to have the advantage uh, in, in international politics, and including in the COVID era. Now, obviously, uh, your book was written uh, before the uh, pandemic. Uh, has, it, uh, has coronavirus uh, affected uh, your overall perspective? Um, it, it hasn't. I think it's actually reinforced many of the themes in the book. Uh, first, the theme of the book is uh, the title is The Return of Great Power Rivalry. And I think we've seen that rivalry is alive and well with the United States and China today. I think the pandemic has actually amplified it uh, with the uh, wars of words, China accusing the United States uh, of causing the, the pandemic through their disinformation, saying it was started by the US Army. Um, the United States, of course, uh, rightly blaming China uh, for the pandemic, uh, fights in the WHO over control there. Um, so the return of great power rivalry is alive and well. Um, and second, you know, some of the initial early reports uh, said, well, China seems to have done better with this. Yes, they might have caused the crisis, but they've put in force tough measures. Uh, maybe it involved holding people in their homes and other uh, uh, dis distasteful things, but they've gotten us under control. Uh, the United States is dysfunctional and, and uh, has a record number of uh, cases. Uh, but I think over time, we've seen that my argument is, is correct, that uh, China's response hasn't been as effective either at home or internationally. Uh, and the United States, like democracies often do, was uh, somewhat slow off the uh, starting blocks, uh, but has uh, now formed a, a national consensus and I think has put in place a pretty effective strategy both at home and, and abroad. Now, in your book, you were, uh, review uh, 
numerous uh, great power struggles across history, uh, Athens and Sparta, uh, Venice and its various uh, competitors, uh, Great Britain and uh, Imperial uh, Germany, and perhaps Nazi Germany as well, and of course the Soviet Union and uh, the United States. Uh, what are the top uh, two, three, four lessons uh, that you learned uh, from those uh, histories? Well, um, that democracies have um, strengths that they've repeated over the centuries and really over the millennia. Uh, they tend to be more innovative and that leads to more uh, economic innovations and economic growth. Uh, they tend to uh, be better uh, uh, for international capital markets. People just feel more comfortable putting their money in democracies uh, than in autocracies. Uh, they tend to be better at building alliances and friendships. Again, I think because they're more trustful and uh, uh, trustworthy and live up to their commitments. Uh, and then maybe surprising to some, they tend to do better in warfare. Uh, and I think that's in part because they are smarter about choosing the wars that they get into. Um, it, it's also because they have the luxury of focusing their military forces on the adversary, not on repressing their own people. Uh, and so we've seen this time and again in, in all the cases uh, that you mentioned. Um, and then the other thing that we see is that people talk about autocratic strengths. And, and I find in the book that actually these are often double-edged swords. Uh, so people say that autocracies can make big, bold decisions uh, get things done. Um, and that's true, and, and that's good if it's the right decision, uh, but what if it's a big mistake? Uh, and in the book, we see autocrats making big mistakes um, uh, frequently, and uh, you know, most notably, and known to your uh, listeners, Russia, uh, or uh, Napoleon, uh, and Hitler invading Russia in, in winter. Uh, so big, bold decision, but it led to uh, them losing wars and to the end of their regimes, and, and that's um, not uncommon. Are there particular lessons uh, from uh, the U.S. and Soviet Union Cold War rivalry that have direct application to China, or does China's economic strength make it uh, unique in that regard? It's a good question, uh, because I think China is a more formidable competitor than the Soviet Union ever was. Um, you know, uh, the, uh, this is the first time in, in its history that the United States has faced a, really a peer competitor, a, a competitor with at least 40 percent of U.S. GDP. Uh, so it's um, uh, more of a peer. Uh, but I think that some of these uh, lessons still hold. I mean, the United States continues to have, uh, I would argue, all of these economic, financial, uh, diplomatic, and military strengths. Uh, and China has some of the uh, typical weaknesses uh, of autocracies. Um, so that might be surprising to some. It seems like China's done well over uh, the past couple of decades, and, and it has. Um, but already we're seeing its autocratic politics interfere with its uh, economic model. Uh, and Chinese growth has been slowing well before the uh, crisis. Uh, China's never really been a financial powerhouse. In fact, wealthy Russians and Chinese stash their money in the United States by real estate in, in Washington, D.C. They don't trust keeping their money in China. Uh, China's not a good alliance builder. It only has one ally, North Korea. Um, it is gaining influence overseas in some ways, but I think is also overplaying its hand and generating a backlash. Uh, and then in military affairs, uh, China's military strength is increasing, uh, but China spends more on internal security than external security. Uh, for the U.S., it's two to one in the other direction. So if you just follow the money, uh, the CCP is more afraid of people in Hong Kong and Xinjiang uh, than they are of the Department of Defense. Uh, so I think for all these reasons, um, uh, again, the United States has some real strengths and, and China uh, some maybe underappreciated weaknesses. I like to say that uh, the United States has friends and China only has uh, pawns and surrogates. And sometimes even that list seems uh, relatively small. You mentioned North Korea, of course. Um, Western elites, American elites uh, for decades have tended to make arguments uh, the opposite of yours, that uh, authoritarian systems, uh, uh, time and history are going to be on their side. Uh, how do you explain that tendency that they're so uh, pessimistic? It's a great question. Uh, you know, I think declinism is something of an American pastime. Uh, in the 1970s, people thought the Soviet Union would overtake the United States. In the 1980s, it was Japan. Uh, now it's China. Uh, we saw that those other two challenges uh, didn't uh, ran out of steam, and I suspect the China challenge will run out of steam uh, as well. Uh, but I, I think part of the reason we see this pessimism in uh, the United States is because we are a democracy. We are an open system. We allow people to voice uh, dissent and criticize the government. Uh, and uh, you know, that kind of dissent is just not uh, permitted uh, in China. I suspect if we allowed 
uh, Chinese people to voice their uh, views. We'd, we'd see a lot of criticism of Xi, of the Chinese model, a lot of pessimism uh, in China, but we don't hear those voices because when, they're, when they speak out, they're uh, imprisoned or, or killed or, uh, or worse. Well, Matt, you're not a, uh, a theologian, but let me uh, stretch and challenge you. Do you think that uh, democracies and free societies have an advantage because uh, arguably they're more in sync with uh, natural law and the human spirit in terms of allowing people to uh, follow uh, their own paths uh, to the utmost of their own creativity in comparison to repressive societies? It's a great question, and uh, you're right, I'm not a theologian, although uh, my wife and family and I go to Christ Church in uh, Georgetown. Uh, so uh, think about these issues, and as you've talked about, I've thought about the uh, kind of moral and uh, uh, issues surrounding nuclear weapons. Um, so democracy is, is usually defended because uh, it protects uh, freedom and, and human rights, uh, and I think uh, that's true and, and one of the strengths of democracies. Uh, and so this book really kind of makes the hard power uh, case for democracies, that democracies aren't just more moral, they're also more powerful. Uh, and I think the reason um, why is for part of the reasons uh, that, that you mentioned, that if you want to be a powerful society, you have to unleash the uh, talents and uh, ambitions of, of your people. Uh, if you're repressing them, repressing uh, the human spirit, uh, that's uh, not good for the individual, it's all not good for the society, and it's not good for the power and influence of the state on the international stage. And then finally, Matthew, um, once we get through uh, coronavirus, does America in the short term emerge uh, stronger or weaker, or is it just uh, too early to say? It's a big question, and I think it's too early to say. Uh, but I do think the United States has these consistent strengths um, on its side. Uh, you know, the Chinese growth model uh, was so artificial uh, because of the heavy state in involvement. And so with this uh, spectacular growth that China's had since the 1970s, uh, they haven't gone through the boom and bust cycles that you go through with a market economic system. Uh, so the United States is uh, used to this. You know, we have a decade or so of expansion and then a retraction and then another decade of expansion. So we've gone through these boom and bust cycles. The CCP has never really experienced this. Uh, so it's really uh, an open question how they'll respond um, and the model in China, uh, the model of domestic political stability uh, for years has essentially been the Chinese Communist Party saying, stay out of politics and we'll promise you continued economic growth. Uh, now they can no longer make that promise. Uh, China's reporting its worst economic numbers since the 1960s. Uh, so I think that raises really fundamental questions about the stability of the Chinese regime. Uh, so uh, I wouldn't shape trade places. I think the United States, uh, for all of its uh, faults, uh, still has fundamentals that are much stronger than those in, in China. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, your book sounds uh, wonderful. Do you have a copy there that you could possibly hold up? In fact, uh, I do. One, one moment. Very good. So let's uh, get that book, and Providence hopefully will be publishing a review soon. And Matthew, I hope to be seeing you strutting down 15th Street at some point soon when normalcy returns. Yes, uh, look forward to getting out of our houses and uh, meeting you in person sometime soon. Thank you, Matthew, again. Thank you, Mark.